Hello, guys. Sorry I'm a minute late. I need to top off my water since we're going to be talking for a while about stuff. But welcome. Looks like we have a lot of people already in the chat. This is awesome. So we are a little bit more than a month out from CASPA opening. The rumor date is April 28th. I don't know if that's been confirmed yet. Um for opening, but it seems like a lot of the questions that were submitted ahead of time were in regards to CASPA primarily, some personal statement, but a lot about CASPA. So you guys had some great questions. We will get to as many as we can tonight in about an hour, and there will be a replay. So if you can't hang out live with us, totally fine. Uh, you can, you know, watch later. We'll send that replay out tomorrow. And it will be on YouTube also. So that's all good. Um, if there are any technical difficulties, uh, you can restart. There should be a little button at the top to kind of refresh. And we found that Google Chrome tends to work better than Safari or any other browser. Uh, so that may help also. And again, it is recorded, so you can refer back later on. Uh, let me see if there's any other housekeeping. You'll see Emily and Michelle in the chat. They are um, awesome. They will point you in the right direction, share links, share stuff that's helpful for what we're talking about. Uh, so if you have questions and they answer, they are official P PA platform people helping you out. So um, the next webinar that we will do is in April. Um, I have a crazy April coming up. And so I know it's crazy for you guys too because CASPA opens, but we want to make sure that we are covering everything. So tonight is like laid back, just Q&A. We're just going to talk uh, in April on April 23rd at eight o'clock we will do um, countdown to CASPA. So really just more of kind of going through the application, like talking about each thing very specifically, each aspect, um, definitely answering questions too, but more of like a walkthrough and to like, hey, this is opening. This is what you need to be doing. This is what you need to know before you get started kind of situation. So a little bit more specific, more of a presentation like we've done in the past. So that'll be on the 23rd and you can sign up. There's the link in the chat from Emily and we will send that out in the email as well. Um, I'm also doing an AAPA webinar on March 20th. They have not given me a sign up link yet, but usually those are pretty limited. And that's going to be more of like a caspa like quick and dirty like this is what you need to know this is what you need to make sure you don't mess up on kind of thing and so that will be on the 20th at 8 so whenever i have a link for that we will send out an email i'll put it on instagram on social media um but again usually those are fairly limited like i think only a certain number of people can sign up and attend i don't think you have to be an aapa pre-pa member they might get preference for signing up um, but in the past, everyone has been able to do that. It's been, I think, two years since I've done a webinar with them. Last year, we couldn't figure out scheduling. Um, so this year, we planned it really far in advance to make sure that we were able to do that for you guys. So yeah, and that's it. Um, if you have any questions for tonight or just in general, if you can keep them in the chat, that helps us. The Q&A part of this webinar thing is kind of weird. Um and hard to track like what we're doing. And so we have a document where we kind of just pull the questions over. So, um, or wait, Michelle, would you rather than be in the Q and A? I guess Michelle wants him in the Q and A tonight. So, um, never mind. scratch what I said. I don't really check the Q and A. Um, I'm looking mostly at the chat. So yeah, let's jump in. Um, I know it can be just a lot and stressful and overwhelming trying to figure all of this out. But that's what we're going to try to make easier is figuring out kind of what you guys need to know, what you can be working on now, and answering some of these common questions we've had. I'm going to start with personal statements just because there weren't as many questions about that. Um, see if we can just like knock those out and then we will get into CASPA stuff. Because CASPA is its like own beast. So things we will not be addressing tonight, just to be clear, we are going to focus on CASPA and personal statements primarily. Um, 
we're not really going to be talking about like interviews or stuff like that. Um, and then we're going to try to keep this as helpful as possible and as general as possible. So if you have a very like specific situation, we're probably not going to get into those too much. Um, so if you have something specific, I would say try to phrase your question in a way that's generalized that would apply to a lot of people so that we can help as many people as possible. Okay. Um, sound good, team? Sound good? How are we feeling? Am my protein smoothie something here in my water so like we should be good to go we can go all night just kidding I have to work tomorrow so um okay I'm gonna start down here with some personal statement stuff did get a lot of questions about from reapplicants too so we'll make sure we address a lot of that um and yeah so if you do feel like you need like very specific one-on-one -on -one help we do have a counseling option um, with myself or one of our other coaches. And really, the counseling is what you make it. So whatever you need help with, like, we'll figure it out together, get you on the right track, um, answer questions, do an application review. We do personal statement editing, but you can do a personal statement review. Um, lots of different ways to kind of use that if needed. So... Yes, Caspa, Caspa. Okay. Um, so let's talk about personal statements just a little bit. So if you, let me read this one. This is kind of a long one, but along the lines of, okay. If you are a reapplicant, what should you be doing in your personal statement the second or third or whatever time you're applying? Um, this is tough because we have to look at, there's some gray area there of was your application ever looked at? Did they ever read your personal statement? If you did not get any interviews, then chances are maybe they didn't. You want to recheck the requirements, make sure that you kind of met all of that when you applied the first time. Uh, if you did get interviews, that's a great sign. And it does mean they read your personal statement and that it was on track and good. But as a reapplicant, you do want to be able to show what's different in your application, what you've done, how you've grown, how you've matured, what you've learned. And that doesn't mean that your reasons for wanting to become a PA will have changed because they probably won't. You probably have those same overarching reasons you're choosing this. But if you can show what's different, if you can maybe use different stories, different examples, that may help um, in most cases, I do think your applications will be compared. And if you just submit the exact same essay, that looks a little lazy. Um, and it's kind of like if it didn't work the first time, why would you just do the same thing again and expect it to work? So I do recommend changing it, editing it, modifying it, get some different eyes on it. But you don't necessarily have to change the entire thing. Okay. So that's like a lot of, a lot of the personal statement questions are about that. Um, let's see. Okay, I clearly need to address that more. Like, I think we, we actually have a blog post about writing your personal statement as a reapplicant. So that may be helpful too, if you're in that situation. Okay, so um, okay, should I explain what I did to improve my low GPA in my personal statement, even though my secondaries also address this? So the way I think about it is if there's any type of red flag that you think could hold you back from getting an interview, it is worth at least briefly addressing in your personal statement. You don't have to dedicate a lot of space to it, but if you can just put a little bit about that in there, um, that may give you enough so that they read your supplementals. Because if it's a low GPA thing, you know, they may not even get to the point where they read your supplementals if they're questioning whether or not academically you're ready for PA school. So if you can include a little bit about that in your personal statement, then you can use your supplementals 
to expand on it and provide more details and description of what happened and what you've done and what you've learned and how it won't be a problem in the future. So there's a little bit of both there, not necessarily an either or situation. Okay, I like this one a lot because I think I get asked this a lot. In your personal statement, is it okay to briefly mention a negative healthcare experience that led you to wanting to become a PA? So, yes and no. Yes and no. Uh, we all have had positive and negative medical experiences and different providers and different people we've interacted with. Uh, the one thing you have to be a little cautious of is throwing an entire profession under the bus because of your experience and elevating another profession because of your experience. There are great doctors. There are great PAs. There are bad doctors and there are bad PAs. There, you know, there's a lot of different um, types of providers out there. And so you can't say from one experience that everyone in that category is the same. So in this case, I think, yes, like you can discuss what happened. Um, I would focus on the positive. So if what came out of that was you found out about the PA profession, you were introduced to PAs, focus on that. Don't be like, oh, the doctor just wouldn't listen to me and gave me the wrong diagnosis. And so all doctors are terrible. Um, and I could never be a doctor because of that. Like, that's not right. Like, if anything, that should make you want to be the doctor to be the one that is the one doing the right thing. Um, but not necessarily. Same thing with PAs. Like, you know, it just, you don't want to, in general, in your personal statement, you don't want to be negative. You just want to keep it positive as much as possible. So it's all about how you focus it. So I think that's a lot of when we're editing we kind of have to shift that perspective a little bit to like, yes, I fully understand you had this terrible experience. I've had some of my own, I can tell you, but, um, you know, focus on the good that came out of it and like what you learned and how it's brought you to this point and how it relates to the prompt. So we're not going to like rant about whatever happened. We're going to focus on the outcome. Okay. Um, quickly, let's address the COVID essay. Will it be on this application cycle? We don't know. We won't know until it opens again. I could see it being on this application cycle. I think it probably will, but I could also see this being the last year that it's on there. Do schools look at the COVID essay? No one knows. <laughs> some schools probably do. Some schools probably don't consider it all. Some schools haven't really considered the pandemic in their application process even since 2020. And so it just depends on the program. They may or may not kind of disclose that. That being said, if the COVID essay is an option, I do typically recommend keeping most of your discussion about COVID in that essay and not making your personal statement about it. So it's like they're giving you the spot to talk about how your application was affected and what it changed, if anything. Uh, so you don't want to take up that space in your personal statement unless it's extremely um, relevant to you wanting to become a PA, which at this point, I think it, it definitely could be. There were some essays I was seeing back in like fall of 2020 that were talking about how COVID made them want to be a PA. And I was like, this is a little weird because it just happened not even six months ago and you're making it this big focus, but you probably should have, it seems like you decided before then. And so it just was weird. Uh, so if it's a big part of your story, include it, but you may have that other opportunity to talk about it also. Talked about that. Okay, a couple more here. Um, do you need to answer why PA versus NP in your personal statement? Not necessarily. So if that was a big part of your decision and you were kind of deciding between the two and for some reason decided to go PA, then yes, explain that thought process. But if you didn't really consider a nurse practitioner or nursing, then you don't need to 
explain that or validate that. I don't think I talked about nursing at all in my personal statement. For me, it did not make sense. And by the time I kind of finished freshman year and decided PA, like I would have had to change a lot of stuff to become a nursing major and kind of backtrack some stuff. So, you know, some people that will be the case, same thing with med school. It may have been a consideration for you. Totally fine if it was, but also totally fine if it wasn't. So you have to decide where your focus is going to be. And I think of these, I talk about it in the personal statement guide. Let me grab it here. So if you are still, if you're still trying to work on your personal statement, um, I talk about it in the personal statement guide, like these pivotal moments of what pushed you, I think I've talked about this in every webinar, what pushed you to the PA profession or away from it. And so you want to think about, like, I like visualize them as kind of these paths that you take that's kind of a fork in the road and you can either go towards the PA profession or away from it. And, uh, you know, you may have not really like a straight path and that's okay. Um, but those are the things you want to focus on. So don't think you don't have to do anything forced. Okay. And then some questions about supplementals, which we will absolutely get to, um, later on. So. Okay, I see some questions from the chat about personal statements too. We'll stand this for a couple more minutes. Um, should so in your personal statement, should you explicitly state that you're a reapplicant? Uh, you don't have to say I'm a reapplicant, but you can say you know since applying last cycle or whatever, and allude to it in some way. A school will only see you as a reapplicant if you have previously submitted an application to their program. So when you log into CASPA in this cycle, if you have entered information, it will give you an option to pull it forward. And technically, CASPA will call you a reapplicant. But the schools are not going to consider you a reapplicant unless you've applied there previously. Now, if you've applied to some schools before and some not, then I think it's still fine to talk about being a reapplicant in your essay. You just have to be able to explain why you didn't apply to their program before and why you are applying there now. Would be my thoughts. Um, okay, another good personal statement question here. What should you be referring to PAs as in your personal statement? For now, we are still using physician assistant uh, until every state or the states that you're applying to and will work in and every program you're applying to adopt physician associate, you will stay with physician assistant. Now, the caveat to that is if you're working on a supplemental for a school that uses physician associate, then use that terminology. So like, for example, Yale Online uses that. So you would want to use physician associate in their um, supplementals and applications. But otherwise, just stick to physician assistant and PA and that's totally fine. Can you just write PA? So in your personal statement, the first time that you write out physician assistant, it should be written out fully with PA and abbreviations. If you go back and watch the live editing, we talked about that a little bit and the proper way to do that. But it is a formal essay. So anything that you're abbreviating, you want to write out the first time put in parentheses, and then you can use the abbreviation the rest of the time in your essay. All right. I think that's a lot of these. Cool. Well, we can put the link in the um, chat for, for pre-PA editing. Somebody asked about that. Um, because, yeah, editing, we edit for content's the big one and then grammar, flow, but really, like, content, making sure that you're on track. And usually turnaround time is, like, three to four days. So we get it back to you pretty quick. And hopefully that will help you out um, with getting on track with your essay. Okay. 
Okay. I'm going to go back. I want to make sure these questions from the chat really get answered. So I'm going to kind of go through these and look at them um, a little bit and then go into some cast ones that were submitted. And all these links will go out in the email we send afterwards, too. I think they may have gone out in the warning time email. I'm not for sure. Oh, we're going to cover a lot of these, actually. Okay. Uh... Okay, cool. I'm going to go back up to CASPA questions, and then we will get to more of those, but I think we're going to cover a lot of them. All right. Let's talk about CASPA. So how many sections are in the application? So there are four different sections, technically, and then they all have little subsections. So your personal information is like your biographic stuff, really straightforward, contact information, not too hard. Then you have your academic portion, and this is going to be all of your schooling. So entering in high school, college, as you've attended, transcripts, and you do transcript entry where you enter in all of the courses that you've taken into CASPA, even though they have your transcripts. So you have to enter all that in. Then you have your supporting information, and that's where you'll put things like experience and evaluations, which is what they call letters of recommendation, um, licenses, certifications, your personal statement, anything kind of extra goes in there. And the fourth section is program materials. Not all programs have their materials through CASPA, but some will. So some will have their supplementals on there where you can put in your essays. Some will have you assign prereqs for them. Other schools will do that outside of CASPA, so you want to make sure you check the program websites. But that's kind of the four areas of CASPA that you'll need to focus on. Um, it is a bit time intensive to enter everything in. It'll take you a little while. Please do not feel like you have to submit day one, day two, even day three or four. Give yourself a moment. Like, work on the application, set aside time, great, and then take a step away and come back to it. So, I've, I see a lot of mistakes made and I get emails where people are freaking out because they put in a placeholder for an experience and they forgot to fix it and they submitted um, or they forgot to add something in. And once you've submitted, a lot of CASPA kind of gets locked and you can't edit it. There are things you can add, but you can't change things. Um, so that would be one of my biggest tips is just you know, start it, work on it early, yes, but take a step away for a couple of days, like give yourself a minute and then get back to it, okay? Let's talk about timing because this is also an area I'm getting a lot of questions about, um, especially on Instagram. Right now, it is mid-March, so should you be sending in documents like test scores and um, transcripts and things like that. So there is a time, let me see if I can find the actual date. Um, there is a time where CASPA stops accepting any documents. And so if your document does not make it by that time, there is a higher likelihood than not that it will not get connected to your account and then you'll just have to resend it later. So this happens with sending GRE scores and with transcripts. Um, so let's see, April 7th is the last date that your transcripts and official test scores are matched to your application. So if they are not in by April 7th, then they're not going to be in. So GRE scores take about two weeks to get back. Uh, transcripts vary a lot. It can be a few days up to a few weeks, depending on how it's requested through your uh, school or registrar's office. So this is a little bit of a risky time if you are sending things to CASPA. You also have to have a CASPA account 
for those uh, documents to be sent. So you want to have a CASPA account set up and then you can send your documents. But just know that there is, again, a chance that stuff does not get connected um, if it's not there. So somebody said, if we send in transcripts now to be verified, will they roll over to next cycle? Your application is only verified when you submit to a school. So pretty much all the school's deadlines have passed. Um, I actually don't even know if they would let you work on anything now because you have to be able to choose a school to work on your application. There's maybe one that you can do, but um, so the only way you'd actually get verified is if you submitted to a program. So your application should still be there uh, next cycle in your application if they do make it in time, but they will not be verified until you submit to that first program. If you have submitted in the past and have verified transcripts, when you pull forward, if you decide to pull everything forward, the transcripts will still be verified. And then if you add any coursework, that will just be verified when you submit for the second time. Sorry, I feel like that was confusing. I said verified a lot of times. So can you make it a CASPA account? Um, so you can make a CASPA account at any time. Um, I believe you can still make one right now. Again, like you have to be able to assign a program. So I'm just not for sure how much they would let you work on it. I haven't tried to sign in lately to my CASPA account. Um, but you can make a CASPA account if you just kind of want to like check it out, see what's up. Um, this is that weird limbo period right now where I just would not, um, I just wouldn't do a lot in there because you just, it, it may or may not. Um, well, there's stuff that'll stick, but like I wouldn't send a lot. And I don't recommend saving stuff in CASPA. Like it should be saved elsewhere, not in CASPA. Okay, so getting some questions, there's some confusion. I thought you cannot pull over new, I thought you cannot pull over information from the previous cycle into the new cycle. Doesn't it get wiped clean? No. So when you go into CASPA the second time, or like when the new cycle opens, you'll be given a choice to wipe your account clean or pull forward your information. And then you can choose which sections to. If you do that, there's going to be usually about a 24 hour period where you cannot access the application and they will email you when it's ready and when you can sign in. So you can pull stuff forward. Uh, letters of recommendation do not pull forward. Personal statements do not pull forward. Experiences, um, transcripts, grades, that stuff, personal information, all of that should pull forward. And then someone said, I thought transcripts couldn't be sent over until the application opens. They can be. Um, they just have to, you have to have an account and then they have to be received again by April 7th to be connected to your account um, and uploaded in your application. So I'm taking the GRE this week. Should I not send my test score to CASPA right now? Let's see how many, how long we have till April 7th. If you're taking it this week, I would try to send it. Um, just know that it may or may not work. So you get those five free things, five free sins. Um, so I would use those. Just know, like, if you're taking it on Friday, there's a chance that it may not be in, in time to be connected. And then do not ask for letters right now. Do not request letters until the cycle reopens in April. Um, if we pull forward, it can't be edited, right? Parts of it can and parts of it cannot. I believe experiences can be. Um, but the transcript stuff, if it's already verified, it cannot. Uh, why would I need to enter the courses I took manually if I have my transcript sent to them from the school? Because they do not do it for you. You can pay them to do it, but otherwise you have to do it. Ask them why. I don't know. Okay, after April 7th, we can't send transcripts or GRE scores. Correct. So if I'm taking the GRE after April 7th for this cycle, it won't count. It'll count. You just won't be able to actually, you won't, You can try sending your scores, but there's a chance that you may have to pay to have them sent later. Are you referring to this cycle for the deadline to send scores? Yes. 
So Emily put the link in there to look at. So CASPA has all of these dates listed in their FAQ. I'm going to put it in there again. So I recommend everyone looking at this so that you can see. So nothing, not for the upcoming cycle. No. So this is all, this is for people who want to get ahead. Again, if it were me, let's say I'm applying in this upcoming cycle, I would not be sending anything right this moment. If I happen to be taking the GRE, I would try to send those scores, but I would know that there's a chance they wouldn't get connected to my account and I'd have to send them again anyway. But I would not be sending my transcripts right now. Um, I would be waiting until CASPA opens in April. Or if you still have classes in progress, you need to wait until those are done if you want them to be verified on your application. So this is something I say, I feel like a gazillion times every cycle. If you, the first time you submit your application in CASPA, they will verify your application, verify your transcripts, and calculate your GPAs. That is done one time per cycle. If you add more courses or send more transcripts, they are not going to verify those classes and they will not change your GPAs. So if you want your spring classes included, if you're taking a summer class that you need verified for a school because it's a prereq or they require it, you need to wait until those classes are complete on your transcripts to enter them in and send them to CASPA and to submit for it to be verified. So there you go. Um, okay, so, so it says, okay, so it says you... The last date you can create an account for this cycle is April 3rd, but if you have an account, you'll still be able to sign in. After April 14th, you won't be able to sign in anymore. But again, like none of this really, like I wouldn't even worry about this if you're not applying right this moment. No, if you clear out your site, if you clear everything out, CASPA will not mark you as a reapplicant, and even if CASPA marks you as a reapplicant, schools do not see you as a reapplicant. I feel like all this kind of like makes sense. No, we're no. When you look at the dates and look at everything, and when you sign in, so we're gonna move on with questions, but. I recommend everyone to, like, I don't think I've said this this webinar, read the entire CASP FAQ, the entire thing from start to finish. Read all of it and then read it again. And then anytime you have a specific CASP question, go straight to the FAQ because most of the time it explains it. So when you email me or message me a question, I'm going to the CASP FAQ to find the answer. Usually I know it, but I want a reference for you. And so go to the CASPA FAQ, and then CASPA is actually really responsive. Um, Twitter, calling, Facebook, you can talk to them, ask questions if there's any, um, any issues there. So you should not send any letters of recommendation until CASPA opens at the end of April. I don't know how to say that differently. Um, if you send a letter right now for next cycle, you will have to ask for it again because it will be deleted no matter what. So you can't save letters. You can't use Interfolio. They have to be directly uh, entered by your letter writer each cycle through email. Okay. I think we covered that. Um, let's go through some like quick ones. Is there a word count for extracurriculars? So experience details, um, the character limit for experience details is 600 characters, including spaces. So that's about a paragraph. Um, gives you enough space to explain kind of what your role was, what the setting was, what you did, what you learned, and Really, I think of these as like mini personal statements so that you can relate it back to why you want to be a PA, essentially. Um, are supplementals 
just questions portions in CASPA are entirely different apps. Sometimes they're entirely separate. Sometimes they're just in CASPA. Um, those aren't cast the questions. When inputting, okay, this is important for us to talk about. So when you are inputting your classes in your academic history section, how important is it that your subject matches the class and how do you decide? So I have a YouTube video where I walk through this because it gets really confusing. And this can be very, very important for your science versus non-science GPAs. So you want to make sure it's correct. And there are some cases where you can use a little leeway with this. And then there are times where you cannot. So CASPA has an entire list of course subjects. And that has all these different titles listed. But it's important to note that CASPA goes by the title of the course first. So it's listed on your transcript as the title and then the subject. So if the title doesn't have something that fits, then it goes to the subject. CASPA does not care what you actually learned in the class. If it says psych, it is a psych class and that is a non-science. Um, if it says biostats, that is a non-science. So when you're assigning these classes, you want to make sure that you're going by that title first. So when I do a GPA calculation and I'm putting stuff in, I have that course subject list up. And if there's one that's questionable, I search for the title and see if there's anything that comes up. If there is, then I use that. If not, we move on to the course subject. Um, there are some that are like other, other health professions, other health, other course like that are a little bit general if it just really doesn't fit with anything like that's a weird kind of like intern type class or freshman seminar kind of thing um and so you do want to do this correctly because again it goes towards your science and non-science gpa so there are a few cases when i've been doing gpa calculations where someone will have a course that's like Technically, it's a public health class, and it's like health management. So, like, management is non-science, but then that title also says health. And so, in that case, like, you can decide and just know that they might change it. So, let's say you got a B in the class. You could choose to put it under management, and that's going to be a non-science. Or let's say you got an A in the class, and you could try to put it under health, and get that A as part of your science um, GPA. So there is, you know, some deciding there of what needs to fit where, but essentially you want to go by the title first and then the subject, and then sometimes you really can't. Um, I, I get emails that are like, oh, but this class was a science class, and this is what we learned. Like, CASPA doesn't care, and that's why going back, if you can kind of, choose your classes, you want to try to choose ones that you know are going to fit that science GPA if that's what you're using them for. Okay, now we have some coursework questions. Okay, so this question is asking about prereqs. In the program material section, some of the schools will ask you to assign prereqs to or assign your courses to the prereqs. So if they do, most of the time you want to just assign the most recent class, the one with the best grade that best fits the prereq. Some schools will tell you to assign every single class that fits that prereq. So you want to go by what the school says, but if they don't clarify, then I would just choose, again, that most recent with the best grade that you feel best fits that class that they're asking for. Okay, so 
Here's a question that is also important. Um, do PA schools accept prereqs from AP classes? The majority do not. So most of them do want to see a grade for a prereq class. And the same goes for pass-fail kind of situations um, where they want to see an actual letter grade. So if you have an AP class that fulfills a prerequisite, that's something you're going to want to check on with each program independently to see if that's something they accept. Some schools will put that on their website, some don't, some are kind of vague about it. But a lot of times those AP classes like AP Stats, Psychology, Biology, you're going to have to retake for a grade to be considered. Um, and that's actually a big reason why applications get thrown out. There's also caveats to that where depending on what it says on your transcript, like if it isn't clear that you got credit for a specific class on your transcript, then it's not going to count. Like if it just says AP credits with a number and it doesn't say AP psychology, that can be a problem also. And that just depends on how your school did it. So those are things to keep in mind. We um, put a link in about AP credits in the chat because it is something that you want to look at ahead of time just so your application doesn't get thrown out. Okay, if you have a reapplication and already submitted, um, okay, if you have a reapplication, so this is kind of the same question. Um, how do we set, add or submit additional courses after we have submitted CASPA? Um, so again, um, I can't, I cannot go to Q&A, Michelle. Like I just, I'm trying to keep up with these. <laughs> Michelle's trying to tell me to look in Q&A. <laughs> Put them here, I guess. Or I'll try to look. Um, but yeah, so after you've submitted CASPA, you can add the classes, but they just won't be verified. And a lot of schools will only look at what's actually verified in CASPA, um, unfortunately. In the doc, while you're down at the bottom. Mm. Okay. If y'all want to, um, this is me talking to Michelle and Emily, if y'all want to like highlight ones that I have already covered or like bold them, then I can make sure I'm getting just the ones we need. Um, Cause these are like not about what we're talking about. Okay. So can you, I'll try to go from here. Can you submit CASPA with courses in progress? Will that be okay? Um, some schools do accept in progress coursework and some don't. CASPA doesn't care. CASPA will let you enter anything that you want. Um, so you want to check with the programs you're applying to to see if your classes, prereqs, major, or degree, all of that can be um, can be submitted in progress or not. When adding grades, will PA schools automatically reject an application with only one C minus? It depends on the school. If it's a prereq and they say you need a C or better or C plus or better, then yes, you won't get considered. Seen a few questions on when is the best time to submit your application. So in general for rolling admissions, the earlier the better and usually shooting for like mid to late May, early June should give you plenty of time and be early enough that you are good to go for most programs. There are a few programs that will start interviewing very early, like even in June. So you want to check or, you know, try to get in as quick as you can. And the one thing I would say is like figure out why you're waiting to submit. Like what is... Um, holding you back. Is it your personal statement? Because that you should be able to work on. Is it a letter that you can follow up on? Like, why haven't you submitted?
Okay, I got a uh, message. Okay, lots of questions, it sounds like, about the professional transcript entry. So CASPA offers a service called professional transcript entry. If you've used it in the past and you pull your application forward, or if you have had your application verified in the past and you pull it forward, all of those verified classes should pull forward and be the same. If you are applying for the first time and entering your transcript information, you can pay CASPA, I think it's per transcript, um, to enter in your courses for you. Personally, I would never do that. I guess I like control too much, and I've seen a lot of mistakes that they make, and even if they make a mistake, it's really hard to get it fixed. Um, and so you want to, I, I don't know, I would rather do it myself, but if that is something you want to pay for, that's totally fine. Um, it is an option. It is a service that they offer. All right. Will miscategorizing, can miscategorizing courses cause a delay in verification? Yes. So things that can cause your application to be delayed and being verified include uh, miscategorizing your classes, not sending a transcript from a school, uh, leaving a school off of your application, um, name issues. So if your name doesn't match and there's a place to put kind of like all your nicknames or maiden name or whatever in there, that can all affect you. One thing to mention about transcripts that I actually haven't seen anybody ask about tonight if you have taken courses at multiple places, which most people have, you need to send an original transcript from each of those institutions to CASPA directly when you're sending transcripts. If your transcript has your transfer credit on it, that doesn't count. You need it from that original institution. You don't want to be using anything as far as transfer credit on your transcripts when you're doing your course entry. And CASPA will not accept that as a transcript. So you'll have to get that transcript from the original program when you are submitting. Okay. Um. I see what I'm missing here. Um, so for international applicants, especially from Canada, it's about the same. If you went to, the only difference is if you went to a Canadian school that speaks French, it's considered a foreign program. If you went to a Canadian school that speaks English, then um, it counts pretty much the same and you would do everything pretty much the same. But the CASP FAQ explains everything for like, Canadian applications pretty clearly. Okay. Getting numbers in here. I remember now why. Maybe, maybe it's because they need to limit webinars. I feel so bad when, like, everyone doesn't get their questions answered. But there's so many. So a couple questions about how can a school tell if your class has a lab? Some transcripts will list the lab separately. Some list it with the class. A lot of times they can tell by the hours. So they'll want you to have a certain number of hours for the class. And so let's say... It's not included. You'll have the lecture that's three hours in the lab that's one or two hours. And then if it's together, it'll be like four or five hours. So they know that by having that longer hour uh, attempted that that included a lab. So that happens. Um, some schools, like if it's not very clear, they will want you to send a syllabus or a description of the course to them so that they know that it included a lab portion if there's a question. My husband's playing video games, so if y'all hear people talking, that's what that is. Um, okay, if y'all... Let's see. 
Um, let's see. I don't know what Emily or Michelle, if y'all have anything specific, y'all are seeing lots of questions on. Follow the questions from the list up top. Okay. Let's go back up top. Because I'm getting overwhelmed. Okay, so questions about what should we put for the description of childhood residency portion? Don't overthink this part. It is a basically one sentence thing that helps them with demographics and statistics, and it is very straightforward. So like for me, I would say I lived in a single family home in a suburban setting. That's it. You could say I lived um, on a farm, a working farm in a rural community. I lived in an apartment with my family in an urban setting. Like it's just very general. It does not have to be anything too crazy. Um, let's see. Can you submit your GRE scores after submitting your application? Yes. So GRE scores are something that you can add to your application after it's submitted. And so another question we get is when can I submit to multiple programs at different times? So yes, you can submit to one program and then add more programs later to submit to. Um, and that happens a lot. The thing to keep in mind is that you're only going to be able to actually change or edit some parts of your application. And again, those grades are not going to be recalculated or re-verified. So you want to make sure that, you know, everything's as good and full as it is the first time or as it can be the first time. And then when you're resubmitting, hopefully not adding that much stuff. Um, so how does, cal how does CASPA calculate GPA? This is an important one um, because CASPA will take into account every single class that you've ever taken, and that includes repeats, community classes, college classes, classes from 20 years ago, any class you've taken at a college, uh, university, community college, technical college level will be included in your GPA calculations. We actually have a blog post that like walks you straight through this that may be helpful to you. Um, and then we also, um, I don't know, let me see if I can find my, um, here, I have it here. So I have a link to what is called mapped.com. Um, and I can show you all mine, but it is a very, very accurate and free GPA calculator and tracker. And you can put in your experience. It has lots of stuff. Um, and if you use my link, um, a lot of the pre-health advisors, which I'm kind of working with them on the pre-PA side of things, um, you can talk to an advisor free for, I think, two months or three months. And then after that, it's like $7 a month if you wanted to sign up. But this is the perfect time to use that because it's free. And then you can just ask your advisor all the questions and they'll point you in the right direction. Um, and again, I'm kind of helping with that, but the GPA calculator on there is fantastic. It is very accurate, way more accurate than the one on my website, which I like have a huge disclaimer on there that it's not as accurate as I would like for it to be. Um, so I think that's a good way to like see trends and see things, um, that would be helpful potentially for you. So if you're worried about GPA, I would say try to figure out what it is before you submit, just so you aren't surprised, especially when those like repeats go in there. Um, so it's called Map. I put the link down there. Uh, let me see if I can put it in here. I just put it in the offers tab, but it's just a link to that. Um, so that may help y'all out. Um, Cause that's a good tool to use like throughout applications. You can kind of track where you're applying and it's got some cool stuff. It's basically, if y'all have heard of my PA box, it's like a free version of that, which, and I, and I think 
better um because i've heard some issues with like the gpa calculator with my pa box so yeah um good option for you guys okay let's see um so when you the other thing about gpas in caspa is once you submit them um, or once they calculate them, it's a lot. So they calculate a ton of different GPAs. The overall and the overall science are the main ones that the PA school schools will really look at. And so they'll look at everything. They'll look for trends, but they really are looking for those specific um, overall and overall science GPAs, which include all of your classes. Okay, I think I did this one. Um, okay, let's talk about letters of recommendation for a little while. Yes, this is uh, recorded. Also, just showing me we need more of this. So I will try to answer a lot of these tomorrow on Instagram, too, just to make sure we're covering a lot of stuff. Like, this helps me know what you guys are struggling with and what you have questions with. So I'll just do a bunch of stories answering questions tomorrow. Um, and probably every day for the next month to try to make sure we're on track. And I think we're going to just do like a weekly question box on there too. Um, we have lots of old posts that address a lot of these things, but I know sometimes it's hard to find stuff. And that's a tip too. Like if you ever can't find something, if you just Google, like if you look up the PA platform letters recommendation. So the, one of the first things that will come up actually is a blog that talks about what your letter writer should be including and how to ask them about letters and kind of some techniques for that. So um, I think, you know, if you can, like, if you want to look up personal statements, you just look up the PA platform, personal statement. Okay. Um, and then go from there. Oh, so I'm just the PA platform on Instagram. I'm physician assistant or the PA platform on TikTok. Um, we're posting a lot of stuff on the PA platform. Physician assistant has kind of turned into just me posting whatever I want and talking about Taylor Swift. So, yeah. Okay. Let's tackle some of these. Uh, let's talk about large recommendation because we haven't really done that. Um, so, number one. Letters of recommendation should be someone professional that you know in a professional setting. Um, letters of recommendation, I would try to ask people that you know personally. That's always the best option. And when you do, you can kind of say, hey, I'm like if it's a professor, hey, I would love for you to write this letter of recommendation for me and talk about my how I've improved in your class and my study skills and what you've seen from me academically, like how you think I would perform in PA school based on how I did in your class. And you can ask them for specific things. So if it's a PA that you've shadowed, you can say, you know, I would love for you to write me a letter talking about how you feel like I would be, you know, good for the PA profession and how I am very interested in learning more about the profession and learning more about medicine when I shadow, you know, all of these things that you want them to kind of focus on because it would be weird if your professor talked about your like ability with patients because they've never seen you do that. Um, as a health coach, would it be beneficial to have a client write a letter? I wouldn't consider that a professional letter. That would be kind of the same as like a patient writing a letter, which I would not recommend. Um, these are professional people who know you in a professional way, um, usually more like on the supervisor side, not on the patient or client side. So again, we're not going to request letters until CASPA opens for the cycle. We've already talked about that. Um, and you can enter, uh, you can enter on up to five letters in CASPA. You cannot choose which ones go to which schools or who looks at which ones. If a school is asking for a specific letter, they will look for that specific letter because they can see who wrote what and like 
the title. So they'll see professor or PA or doctor or supervisor or whatever. So they'll be able to find your letters if you have more than what they're asking for. And so it does not matter. The order that you put your letters into CASPA is, does not matter. Um, I recommend waiving your right to see the letter. Um, sometimes a letter writer may show you your letter outside of CASPA, and that's fine. But it just looks a little fishy or like you don't like trust them if you don't waive that right to see the letter. Okay, let's get into some PCE questions. We're going over a little bit, but that's okay. We'll do some of these. And then, like I said, I have a list of, I don't know, like 500 questions to answer tomorrow on Instagram. So it's good. It's good. This helps me. This will help for the next cast one to know kind of what we need to cover also. Um, Emily just put a link in the chat with some email templates we have too for like asking for letters and following up with letters. You don't have to use these verbatim, but it gives you a, a good start. Um, if you need that. All right. So do programs verify your experience? Well, they could and they might, but do they most likely not in many cases? So let's think about this. Like if each applicant, let's say they get a thousand applications and each applicant has three experiences they're going to have more than that they're like 10 that's like a ridiculous amount to try to verify so the only time they may verify this is if there's a question about it or if they um, want more information they may just verify it with you first so in most cases this is on the honor system but there is always a chance that they could use that contact information to um get get more information if needed. Um, okay, for the experience details section, should you use paragraph or bullet points? It does not matter. I've seen both done well and I've seen both done not well, but it is about consistency. So whichever one you choose, I would keep it the same throughout your entire application. So whether you go paragraph, whether you go bullet point, I don't think one saves on space more or is easier to read or better. Um, personally, I'm like a paragraph person because I like it to be kind of like a little story, but bullet points can do the same thing. Uh, but yeah, personal preference does not matter. Just keep it consistent. And I saw somebody say, like, what is mapped app for? So one thing you can do in there is actually write out your experiences. So if you, you should not be saving those in CASPA. So if you need somewhere to save those, you can actually go ahead and put them in there. And then you can just pull them over into your application um, and kind of have those descriptions. Yeah, so somebody said they saw a school ask your job to certify that you worked with them. Yeah, so they may ask. They may ask your job and they may not do that till after you're accepted either. So, for example, like at my program, you had to have 100 shadowing hours. And this is kind of interesting. I don't know if they still do this. But if you had 100 shadowing hours by the time you actually applied and were interviewed, then you didn't have to verify them. But if you didn't, then you had to have this form signed by everyone you shadowed before you started. But like not everybody did. So if you had not enough hours, then you had to do it. But if you already had enough hours, you didn't have to do it. I don't know. Yes, I said you should not ask for letters until the cycle opens in April. Because they will get deleted. Um, can you upload your resume in the experience section? So there are some schools will ask you for a resume in there and there is a place to upload documents. So you can upload copies of like certifications, um, your resume, anything that needs to be uploaded in there. Okay. We are over on time. I know we did not get to nearly as many questions as I wanted to. 
So we're going to have to figure out a better way to do this. And I don't know what that is. That might be limiting how many people do. We, I don't know what, I don't know how to do that, but we'll figure it out. And I'm going to try to get as many of these questions answered this week again on Instagram as possible. So tune in there stories, watch out for question box. Um, but if I keep talking, I'm gonna lose my voice and not be able to talk to patients tomorrow. So thank you all for watching. This was a little overwhelming. We haven't done a big Q and a this much in a while. Yes. I think we're gonna have to be like even more specific. Um, so like last year I did two webinars a month and they were very specific as they were a little bit different, um, which y'all can still access those. So if this is something you need help with, um, we'll put that link. I'll put it in the replay email actually, cause it's all still very valid. Um, and y'all can get access to that if that would be helpful to y'all. Um, we called it like our all access webinar pass. I think there's like 25 webinars that are very, very specific. So I think that could be something helpful if you feel like hearing about things is helpful in presentations. We did a lot of presentations and some Q and a, but they were like much smaller. So maybe that would be something that y'all can check out. Um, and I'll put that in the replay email so y'all can get that. But thanks for tuning in and I hope everybody has a great week. And again, I will, am I going to bring the podcast back? Yes. Hopefully April that this is like the sign that I need to bring it back. Yes. I am hoping April will bring the podcast back. So, um, all right. Thanks guys.